Good morning, and welcome to Monmouth College. What a great turnout. Wonderful mix of current faculty and retired faculty, current staff and retired staff, current trustees and retired trustees, and of course, our students. We're delighted that you're here for the Wendell Whiten Memorial Lecture. This is one of the highlights of our academic year. We are happy that this year's lecture will be presented by a Monmouth College graduate, Dr. Hiro Fujita. He will talk about his experiences of growing and his uh, company, Quality Electrodynamics, growing into one of the uh, fastest or biggest uh, growing companies in the U.S. He will be the first Monmouth graduate to give this lecture since Walter Huff in 2004. Actually, a few years ago, the father of a Monmouth student gave the lecture, and I invited his son to come and attend and sit on the front row, like Dr. Uh, Pachita's two sons are sitting on the front row today. And that student said he was very busy and had to go to class and couldn't possibly come and hear his father speak. So I saw him right after the lecture and I said, how was class? And he said, you know, I fell asleep. I don't know how it was. <laughs> and I said, well, you could have come and slept through your father's lecture as well. So uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye here on the front row and, and uh, see if anyone nods off. On behalf of Monmouth College, I would like to thank the Whiteman family who make this outstanding lecture series possible. Wendell Whiteman, a graduate of Monmouth College, worked for 50 years at Security Savings and Loan Company, 24 years as its president. Think about that, amazing to go 50 years without uh, making any major mistakes so that you can stay at the same place. <laughs> Wendell was a member of the Faith United Presbyterian Church for seven decades and the Monmouth Rotary Club for nearly a half a century. And that's even more amazing, right? 70 years without any major sins to stay in the same church. The so Whiteman family established this lecture series in his honor following Wendell's death in 1992. Representing the family today is Ralph Whiteman, a 1952 Monmouth graduate. Ralph, would you please stand and let us show our gratitude? As has been our tradition with this series, our speaker will be introduced by a mom of college student. Please welcome Mrs. Susan Riberty, a senior from Pontiac, Illinois. Like our speaker, Susan has studied physics at Monmouth and is interested in medical physics. She is currently enrolled in the biomedical physics course and for the past two years has done research in ultrasound imaging with Dr. Tim Stiles. Susan? Ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, Ova 
been 21 years after you know, uh, I graduated from Mam Mammoth College in Physics and Mathematics. And uh, I never imagined that uh, there would be a day when uh, I can take uh, my wife, who is always also a graduate student, a graduate from Mammoth College, and uh, our sons, uh, you know, two boys here. So to us and to my family, it's a very special uh, feeling. And uh, I would like to thank uh, President Adesua and uh, uh, Mrs. Desua and uh, all the faculties and uh, community friends to uh, welcome us uh, to this beautiful, you know, uh, city Mamos, which has not changed for the last 21 years. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, this gives me a tremendous, uh, you know, opportunity for me to uh, see uh, my professors, uh, who I took, you know, my physics courses and uh, mathematics, you know, courses, English courses. I mean. There are many things I, I did with these uh, wonderful mentors and professors, and they haven't changed uh, for the last 21 years. <laughs> also, so uh, once again, thank you very much for uh, you know having me here. I'm very you know immensely honored to uh, be here to speak with you and share my story, which you know uh, is one of the many examples I think. But uh, what I want to accomplish today is to talk about how I went. To uh, you know, how I came from Japan, and then come to Mammoth, came to Mammoth, and then went to Cleveland, and then did all the things. But at the end of the day, I mean, as I will be talking today, uh, it's a journey that we don't know yet today, as of, as of today. You know, if you talk about what will be our future, nobody can answer that question. But you want to believe in the future, your future being bright, and very, you know, uh, have a lot of opportunities. So I hope, uh, uh, you know, the audience, if the audience can get uh, this message from my story, I think uh, my job will be done today. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, my presentation. Actually, uh, I have a three affiliations from, uh, with other universities, uh, Keshe Western Islam University, uh, the physics department, and also School of Medicine. And also, I am a professor at the University of Queensland, Australia. So, uh, although I have been focusing on business life uh, these days, I still have a academic connections uh, so that I can, you know, write papers and uh, write grants. So it's quite exciting. So I was actually um, in Europe last week. I mean, my life has been quite crazy because. Uh, even last year, I probably spent close to four months uh, abroad, and it's all because uh, you know of uh, growing business that we are trying to manage. Uh, as you will see, our customers, I mean, are giants in the whole world: um, Siemens, Samsung, which you know uh, is doing so many things in the smartphone industry today. Toshiba and GE. I mean, so these are the customers of ours. And uh, because we are making a medical equipment to advance the uh, healthcare technologies, in, not only in this nation, but also elsewhere, you know, we have to, I have to meet with their CEOs to talk about what the next technology will be so that we can, you know, collaborate and we can make an effort together to create a, a, a new, you know, medical technologies. That's the reason that I spend a lot of time, uh, not only in America, but uh, in other countries as well. So these are the places I go back and forth, back and forth. And uh, of course, my family complains a lot. But uh, uh, the reason why I can do what uh, I can do with my colleagues is because of the support from my family, my wife, Mikiko. Uh, you know, she has not complained to me. I mean, she has been supporting me for all these years. So I'm very grateful to her and my boys. I'm sure that uh, sometimes, you know, they feel that how come my dad is not at the game? You know, today is a football game or baseball game. I mean, I missed many, many things of their, uh, uh, you know, school activities. So I uh, feel a little bit bad about it, but uh, uh, I'm very grateful for their support and understanding. So as uh, uh, she kindly, you know, kindly, uh, uh, you know, introduced just in her speech, last week while I was in Europe, I was, uh, uh, you know, contacted by the Department of Commerce U.S. Uh, government. So I'll be serving as a U.S. Manufacturing Council member, which are 26 members. But uh, uh, the purpose is that, you know, what I do 
is manufacturing. And uh, I truly believe that this, in this country, we have to once again look at the importance of uh, manufacturing capabilities and then try to create jobs and then you know, high-tech uh, uh, businesses because to be able to make something is a know-how, a priceless know-how. So, you know, you may hear this story from others. For example, if I make a product in China, it's going to be cheaper, therefore I can get more profit. It may be so for that time being, but in the long run, we are losing something very, very essential to, to, to our community. To be able to make something is a priceless know-how and uh, asset of our, you know, our, our country. So that's what I have been you know, uh, promoting and keeping you know, uh, with the government people. Okay. So my goal is, you may, actually I gave a three lectures yesterday. And uh, uh, some students asked me, and then we talked about it. Why do we even care to do business? And uh, I did mention to uh, some students yesterday, if we say that we want to make money, that could be one answer, but that's not my answer. My answer would be that we have, you know, I have wonderful colleagues, as I am going to show you, and uh, I want to actually make a company or business that makes a positive impact in our society. Could be it could be the United States or other countries or you know the entire world. And then I want my colleagues to feel that this business is something they love with their pride and then they, they feel that they are belonging to that business and trying to do the best of what they can be every day so that we are going to create and add a new value to our society. That's what I want to do. So if we do that, other things will follow. I mean, you know, my company is only seven years old, so it's, it's nothing compared with a you know, hundred years old company. But what I know up to this point is that if you try to do the great things, other things will fall. And that's, that's been the case you know, at our business. And that's what I want to talk about. So I always talk about this, you know, doing the right thing as a human being. Well, our company has now 135 employees, full-time employees. And um, they come from other countries as well. So we actually have seven different countries <coughs> represented uh, in our business. And uh, the question is, so they have different values, social values. They have uh, different religions, maybe. And they have different educational backgrounds, family backgrounds. So how do we work together? Because at the end of the day, no matter what we do, business comes down to people. That's always the case, no matter what you do. So my effort has been, how can, can we work together to you know, create something great? So I have you know, learned from other people as well. But what I believe is that if we do the right thing as a human being, that should be the guideline, and that should be the direction that we should follow. So that's what I have been talking since day one. So, you know, that's, what, that's the reason I want to, I want to you know, um, push the security to the future. Well, but I just didn't appear from nowhere to this place, <laughs> right? So, this is a very brief uh, history of mine. I went to uh, Waseda University in Tokyo. I had the opportunity to go to UCSD, University of California, San Diego, and I had a culture shock. Because, uh, you know, you may not know, but the Waseda University is uh, one of the best schools in the country, in, in Japan. So if you get in there, you are going to have a good career and a good uh, life and a professional life. That's almost guaranteed. So it's a prestigious school. So I was, you know, I was happy to be there. But once I went to UCSD, I saw many students doing so many different things. You know, it was up to them to choose what they want to do, which was quite different from the way we did in Japan. Because in Japan, there are protocols, there are status quo. You want to follow that. You don't want to deviate from it. So that's the, that's the reason that it's a very homogeneous, uniform society compared with the United States. 
Here, everybody does what he or she wants to do. It could be bad, but actually, you know, it has more opportunities if you are determined to be successful. So, I went to UCSD and I had a culture shock, I told you. So I went back to Japan and I said, I am going to come to the United States. Well, at that time I didn't speak English, I couldn't. So I uh, give a lot of credit to uh, Mrs. Lim when went there because she taught me English here. The reason why I came to Mamos was that this is a beautiful, uh, uh, small college with uh, you know, wonderful faculties and professors. So if you want to, you could monopolize all the faculty <laughs> because you know, the number of students is not that big. So you can interact with professors and then you can also you know, uh, train yourself uh, so that you appreciate the US culture and also you, know, you can become familiarized yourself with uh, how we do things here. That's exactly what I did. I have uh, had a wonderful experiences with my professors. That was from uh, uh, 92, uh, up to 92. And then another you know, uh, wonderful experience I had was the uh, semester program at the uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. That was great. I mean, I enjoyed it. So this college provided me with a lot of opportunities, unique opportunities, intimate opportunities, so that you can learn a lot if you want. And that's what I I went to Case Western Reserve from 92 to 98 for my physics PhD. And uh, I was actually offered a job by a British company, uh, British Aerospace Radar Research. So they were making antennas for defense system, etc. They had a medical system division. I was offered a job while I was a graduate student because I was uh, trained as a high energy physicist. But uh, uh, what it means is that you'll be trained with uh, you know, highly complex mathematical skills, uh, modeling skills, numerical simulations. You know, <laughs> so this medical company wanted to, me to analyze the electromagnetic interaction between the patient and the MRI scan, which was very, very complex, of course, because human body is very, very complex. It's not just a homogeneous, you know, rectangular shape, it's not. I mean, it, it has a different, uh, you know, organs and uh, tissue properties, so we have to do a lot of simulations. I did that, and the outcome, I mean, they all liked what I did. So they said, Yo, we don't want you to look for a job. We don't even want you to go back to the graduate school. So stay here, we'll sponsor your green card. So I said, that's great, because the stipend I was making as a graduate student was $1,000 per month, which was a lot. But when I joined the picker, I mean, my uh, you know, salary went to $55,000. So there was no grade. I said, of course I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, I started uh, my uh, science career uh, at picker. And then, uh, in the following year, I went back to the case to defend my thesis and PhD. So I graduated in my case. Well, so I was a scientist at PICA for two years, and uh, I was doing the you know, simulations and modeling of the human body and the systems, which was great, but I was getting bored because I always felt that I can do more. I want to do more. I want to have a much bigger picture as opposed to just uh, zooming into a tiny you know, area. So I felt that you know, I should do more. Those are the times, I mean, you know, I was uh, offered two jobs from uh, two different companies, and uh, uh, I accepted an uh, offer from uh, USA Instruments, which was a startup company in the medical equipment uh, manufacturing business. Well, I did a lot, but then in uh, one and a half years, that company was acquired by GE General Electric. So I became a GE employee, uh, since 2001, and um, it was great because uh, uh, that startup company was a supplier to all these global companies, you know, including GE, Siemens, Toshiba, Hitachi, you know, Philips, all the big ones. They are all competitors. Now, GE acquired this key company, you know, key device company. What happened? other competitors couldn't get the products they needed. So while I was doing quite well at GE, because of what I did at the startup company, 
I was approached by uh, two gentlemen, uh, you know, Toshiba and Siemens, uh, CEOs, that, Phil, why don't you start your own business? Then we could have, uh, you know, projects for you. I mean, that happened independently, not simultaneously, because they are competitors. Well, it was good for me to hear that. But, um, you know, one would say that, yeah, that's, that's great. But, uh, yeah, we will see how it goes. But truly, when these CEOs came to see me in Cleveland with a business proposal, I told my wife, I am going to resign from the tomorrow. Because I felt it was once in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, this is an opportunity that I must not let go. Because GE, I can always go, go back if I want to. I was very good. So I knew that I can always go back if I want to. So in any case, I left um, uh, GE in 2005. And then, actually, I uh, started working the contracts with uh, Toshiba and Siemens because it's a business contract. So it requires a lot of time and legal services. So I spent a year to prepare that for those as a professor at Case Western Reserve University. That was between 2005 and 2006, February. And then, February 20th, I started you know, my company here. That's a very brief story. Now, I don't know how many of you have uh, heard of uh, Steve Jobs' uh, commencement speech at Stanford in 2005. If you do, I mean, can you give me some hands? I think, uh, especially, uh, you know, students, I encourage you to, you know, download uh, the YouTube or, you know, visit Stanford and listen to his uh, announcement speech. I truly believe, I mean, one of the things he said there was connecting the dots. Well, as you see here, all of us have so many dots in our life, right? I mean, it, you know, this is a dot to me. And then it could be a book to you as well. But along the time axis, you know, I came to Mamos, I mean from Japan, and then I went to Case Western. And then, you know, during that time I met with wonderful professors. They are all dots. So now I look back at my life. What I can say is that I see. I went there and then that now takes me to this place. When you are doing that, you will not know that, as Steve said. You know, you will only appreciate what your past, you know, has been after you connect all the dots and then look back. I think this is very true and uh, that's what I share with my colleagues as well. So, life is not a collection of what happens. It's all about how we respond to each dot and, uh, you know, that's very true. I mean, for example, I went to Wasel University, I told you, right? I told you that it's uh, one of the best schools. But actually, my first choice was the University of Tokyo, which is the best of the best. I, you know, failed to go, to go in there. I went to Wasel University, which was still great. Right? But then I started looking at other opportunities, right? If I were, uh, you know, admitted to the University of Tokyo, I probably didn't even bother to come to other, other places. I said, I'm fine, I'm going to do whatever. So now I appreciate what it meant to me, to my life. So that's basically, a, you know, the story of mine and yours too, because you have the boss also. This one, uh, let's see. Uh, is this it? Yeah. Okay. So two boys here, when I started, uh, you know, uh, business, they were this small. And then this was my office uh, at Case Western Reserve. And then in 2006, as I said, I started my business with uh, 3,500 square foot. And then 2007, you know, we had to, we had a new product introduction. The difficult thing was that not only did we have to develop a new product, but also we had to qualify the company I started as a medical device company, manufacturing company, in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan, because that's where we exported our products. So the good thing was that I hired all these key people who I knew from the industry. So I knew exactly what I needed 
to make uh, uh, this startup company functional and successful. So the experiences I got uh, from GE was what great because I was able to get that 360 degrees you know, perspective on what the business is all about. You can also imagine I went from a startup company to GE, which is a, you know, one of the biggest companies in the whole world. So I know how small companies work. I, I know how biggest companies work as well. So I can appreciate all this. So that was very important to me to have the orientation plan. And then, you know, we out to the uh, factory, so now we have this um, 35, some, uh, 35 thousand square foot uh, factory which we have maxed out. So I am trying to buy now 100,000 square foot building in Cleveland. So it's great to you know, have uh, employees who believe in the opportunity, who are united on the belief that let's do the right thing as a human being and then let's do something great to our society while having a pride in what we do. I think that's a key, key message I want to give. Okay. Now, I did not talk about anything about my business up to this point. So you may be wondering, okay, what is this guy making? You know, yes, he has some kind of company, but we don't know what he's doing. So please bear with me for the next, uh, you know, four slides. I'm not going to use any questions so that you don't have to fear that. We are you know, making a uh, key device to the MRI scan. If you have opportunity to have an MRI scan in front of you, and if you have opportunity to cut it in half, this is what you are going to see. Okay. Main magnet, which is a superconducting, you know, magnet, producing highly homogeneous, very strong, you know, static magnetic field. Often, you may say that it's 20,000 times the earth magnetic field, so you know how strong that is. Okay, that's this main magnet bezel. Just uh, remember this bezel, okay? And then, there are other magnets also, because in MRI, you use three different kinds of magnetic fields. Highly static magnetic field, I started magnetic field, small one, small order, and then radio frequency magnetic field. Those are the three kinds of magnetic fields you need to do MRI, okay? And then, don't worry about the details. So, you know, you have seen the MRI scanner now. What does it do? Does somebody know how MRI works? Actually, it's very fascinating because it's a, uh, you know, the reason why it, I enjoy uh, MRI field is that it's a uh, area where medicine, science, engineering, chemistry, biology, computer, you know, uh, processing, image, pro image processing, they all have to come together. It's a wonderful collaboration field. That's what fascinates me, okay? So, all of us today here, okay, you have, your bodies are mainly made of waters, yes? 60% roughly, H2O molecules. Now, in nature like this, we are not magnetized because when you look at the water molecules, they are like small tiny magnets because they have, uh, you know, intrinsic spin called, you know, intrinsic uh, uh, angular momentum called spin. So, in nature, although we have so many spins, you know, proton spins within our body, they are randomized, randomly distributed. Therefore, net spin or net magnetization is that you are not magnetized. Now, you remember, Visa, I told you that strong static magnetic field? Your body now is immersed into that highly static magnetic field. Then what happens? All these spins, proton spins, are trying to line up with the direction of laser, creating very big, measurable magnetization. Now you are magnetized. In the MRI scanner, all of you will be magnetized. 
Okay, that's what it is. Well, we say MRI is much safer than <coughs> X-ray CT because X-ray CT, you know, they use radiations, highly invasive. But MRI, we only use magnetic fields. So, it's safe. I mean, that's what we believe. And I hope that's the case. <laughs> but I mean, so far, we haven't had any complaint. Okay? But in any case, we now have, uh, we now magnetize your body. My business, I told you, radio frequency core, or you can say antenna, okay? Antenna can be transmitted, transmitter or receiver, right? I told you, B1, okay? You apply B1, which is a radio frequency magnetic field, perpendicular to the direction of the diesel, then your net magnetization will be flipped over, okay? Like this. If I stop applying this radio frequency pulse, what do you expect? They will try to go back. Yes? The way it goes back is a function of where these protons are located within your body, like cancers, fat, you know, uh, muscles, all these different constituents, because the way they go back is very different, depending upon, you know, as I said, the location. Therefore, it gives different contrast. If I don't have a brain cancer, I image my brain, it's homogeneous. I should just see very homogeneous brain image. But if I have a brain tumor, brain tumor appears to be very bright. Why? Because although they are in protons, the way they go back to the original state is different. Therefore, it gives context. Therefore, it, you can see the difference. And that's what our device does. Okay? And uh, in this case, what are we measuring? As I said, we are measuring energy, you know, um, but in this case, energy is nothing but induced voltage, which is d5 over dt, magnetic flux change in time. That's exactly what we are measuring. So our antenna picks up that induced voltage and then change to images, pictures. That's our business, okay? So that's it. And uh, uh, we have so many different antennas given the patient body, from head antenna to you know, shoulder antenna to wrist to knee to spine to you know, heart, anything. The reason is that when you talk about antenna, what's important is to maximize sensitivity, yes? Sensitivity is signal to noise ratio, SNR. SNR means picture quality, just like your digital camera. The higher the pixels are, the clearer the picture becomes. So same idea. So our business is trying to, you know, develop an uh, antenna with, with a higher sensitivity, signal to noise ratio. Therefore, we can, you know, see the, we can take the images of the brain and then can detect a tumor at its earliest stage. That's what we are trying to do, okay? Today, our customers are all giants. I mean, they are truly the biggest uh, companies in the whole world. And that's the reason that uh, all of us are very busy, and I have to go to all over the countries and all over the world to, to talk about uh, business development and uh, you know, product development. Well, so, <laughs> we do from uh, MRI, radio frequency course, organ transplant. We are now trying to, you know, expand the organ, uh, you know, uh, from the bones, because many organs are thrown away because of the very subjective judging criteria as to how good these organs are. We are developing a device which can objectively tell if these organs can be used for transplant. But in any case, that's what we do. We have more than 130 employees, and uh, I started the QD in 2006. So today, I mean, up to the end of 2012, we had a uh, 3,350 percent increase in revenue. And uh, what's in, what may be interesting to you is that we have no investors, we have no bank loans, and we have no debts. 
Therefore, I can come to enjoy this uh, occasion. Otherwise, I'll be working for you know, shareholders and uh, also you know, investors. So in any case, it's been great. Now, we have two distinguished gentlemen here as uh, our you know, board of directors, I mean, external board of directors. They are truly wonderful. One is a uh, Mr. Albert Rodden, uh, which I will just mention in the next uh, slide. He's a chairman of the Forest City Enterprise, which is a major developer of buildings, airports, you know, uh, uh, in the country and uh, in other countries as well. And then Mike Esposito, who has been the CFO at the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City. His boss is that uh, uh, very famous David Rockefeller, 97 years old. So what's, happen what's happening to us is that these two gentlemen came to our business almost every week and train us because they say it's one thing to have a good numbers, it's great, here you are doing fine. But in order for you to become a, you know, one of the most respected companies, you have to know other things. You have to even zoom into financials and you have to know, you know uh, this and that. So they came to see, see me and then they have been giving me lectures every month, which is quite uh, tough. But I mean, I've been very fortunate. This is another thought to me, because the way I met with them was, was not planned. It just so happened. And uh, I'm just, therefore, I am very grateful for each opportunity that I have, and I want to give my best. And then the first thing they said was, uh, you, know, you never ever talk about revenues in public anymore. That's what they said. They said, up to that point, I mean, we have to send the financial data to, for example, folks and others. They said, you don't do that anymore because you are a private company. You never tell others how much you make. So I was told, hide all the numbers. <laughs> okay. Now, I have another gentleman who I have been respecting, uh, you know, for all these years. This uh, gentleman is an 81 years old gentleman. Mr. Kazuo Inamori, you may not know him, but if you are in Japan, everybody knows him. He is that famous. He is the uh, founder of Kyocera Corporation, uh, known for you know semiconductors and then, you know and the KDDI, which is Japanese equivalent AT&T or Verizon phone company. And then he was the chairman of Japan Airlines, which was bankrupted three years ago. But uh, he was asked to uh, task the uh, uh, you know. Uh, task the, the buying lines to bring it back. So in three years, he made it the most profitable airline companies in the whole world. So I have learned a lot from him. Uh, and uh, you know, his message has been always this. People have no higher calling than to serve the greatest good of humankind and society. And the future of humanity can be assured only through the balance of scientific progress and spiritual maturity. I think this is very true. I look at what he has done with his colleagues. So uh, when I started my business, I told my colleagues that this is going to be our operating principle. Because if we do this, other people want us to you know, be successful. They will support us. It's mutual. So we always try to you know, uh, remember what, uh, what uh, this message is. I told you two role models. Mr. Inamori and Mr. Rato, and uh, we had a some celebration. But I told you, Mr. Inamori's case, he says, pursuing what is right for humankind, which I already told you. Mr. Rato, I learned a lot from him. And uh, as a human being, although I am speaking to you all the things that sound correct and right, but as a human being, I struggle also. Sometimes, you know, I, I have issues, uh, maybe I envy some, some other businesses, or I, I envy you know, other people. I mean, I'm no different from other people, right? When I do that, his message is that when you go through life, keep your eyes on the donuts, not upon the hole. So what he was saying to me was that you have a wonderful family, you have a great business, you have great friends, you have great colleagues, so what are you complaining about? <laughs> Stay focused on what you are giving, what you have. Don't look at what you don't have, because then your life will be miserable. So 
I always try to, you know, when I have a moment where I become upset, I always try to tell myself, don't forget about the moment. That's a secret message I'm talking to myself all the time. So, as I said, the reason why I can do QED today is not because we told everybody, let's make money and uh, let's enjoy our life. It wasn't the case. I told you. As a physicist, I learned the equation of motion. Yes? But there is such a thing, equation of life, which is what I emphasize to everybody tonight, uh, you know, at, at my business. Our outcome in life is a product of three conditions. Ability times effort times attitude, right? Ability can go from zero to 100, right? I mean, I may be very good at math, but I'm not good at art, for example. So I can be maybe, you know, score of 80 or 90 for the math as the ability part. But still, I have to make an effort. Otherwise, if I don't make an effort, nothing happens. So effort can be also from zero to 100, right? But the key thing is that I was very happy yesterday. I was uh, speaking to uh, in some class, uh, business uh, class yesterday. And then one student asked, I mean, the question I asked was, what is the most important thing to look at the time of the interview? You know, when I try to hire somebody, what do I look for? And then one student said, attitude. That's exactly what I believe, because attitude can go from minus 100 to 100. No matter how smart you are, if you are not a team player, you are nothing but a distraction to the team. In fact, you don't do any good. You better not to be there. So I always say that a normal person like us, yes? If we make a great effort with positive attitude, we can outperform a genius with negative attitude. So that's the reason that when I try to hire people, I focused on that aspect because I don't care how smart you are. I care about your integrity, your character, your human being attitude. You know, that's what I. That's what we care. So this is what I say. Another thing, as I said. We have many dots every day for many years to come. Just believe in your future. You are the great institution mamas today. We don't know what's going to happen to all of you uh, five years you know, from today. But if you believe in your future, you can give your best <coughs> shot every day for what you do every time, right? Because that will take you to a different location, different place, different people. And that's great, because that's going to you know, enrich your life and the life experiences. That's what I mean here. And then, as I said, if you are trying to do the right thing, the community will support you. They will be proud of you, because I have a company, Quiva, making devices, manufacturing you know, medical devices. But because of what we do to the community, they care about us as if our company is theirs, although they are not employees of our business. And they care about it, they help us, that's great. So you always have to work together to create win-win synergy. Okay? Well, I, this is a result of what I just said. We, are, we have been very fortunate because we received uh, you know, so many recognitions and awards from many different uh, institutions and uh, uh, you know, uh, organizations. I'm actually very grateful because this gives us motivations and inspiration to our, for our employees as well. So we keep going. And, you know, another thing is that we have received a uh, you know, small, I mean, small business administration grant. Uh, and then, in fact, uh, our company received the Hidets National Award. So I was invited to you know, the DC, and um, actually I go to DC quite a bit, 
and get involved with uh, uh, policy making and uh, other opportunities. But it's great because these things would go back to the colleagues and then they'll be very proud of what we do and they can they want to do more and then they want to you know go above and beyond. That's great. Um, so let's say we we you know I have opportunities to go to DC and then meet with uh, interesting people and then those are to me uh, as I said, another you know, set of uh, dots. So it's a question of how you, you know, make an effort for each event and then try to connect the dots. Um, as uh, kindly mentioned, I mean, this was a, a snapshot at the State of the Union. And this was New York Times, but uh, I was here and then Pass Radio was here. This was another tremendous uh, you know, opportunity and honor for our family because then we say this is great because what we are doing, you know, other people, other leaders are also very powerful. So, I mean, this is a good cycle, and then you want to keep the good cycle when you do business. And actually, it may go, you know, far beyond just doing business. Even the friendship, you know, you want to be, you want to make sure that you have a great synergy with positive attitude so that you'll be enabled more. In fact, I will be, I have been enabled more because of these uh, experiences. Uh, this was on the TV. And then I met with the uh, president uh, uh, four times up to this point. And uh, every time I, I have uh, some words, I get inspired because I'm sure he's the busiest individual in the whole world. But he always smiles. And then he thinks of the nation. I mean, we have a lot of opinions uh, I mean, from a different parties. But uh, it's wonderful to see a great, respectable leader. So, I was asked to write a, uh, a story on the, uh, this was the NIH. As I said, our company has received the NIH grant. So we did so much, so NIH wanted to feature us on their website that their money was worth it. So that's what I meant. If they are the ones to, you know, uh, uh, congratulate us on what we have done, you are, you are basically you know, creating this win-win cycle, which is great. I also had an opportunity, uh, the White House asked me to write an uh, article on the website about U.S. manufacturing. And uh, as I said, I believe in manufacturing capabilities. It's, it's a fundamental you know, asset to our nation. So you know, I have a lot of opinions, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do at uh, QED. So I think I'm coming to, a, to, to the end of my talk. But, uh, in order for us to be united, whether it's business or community, we want to have the ethical leadership, you know, doing the right thing as a human being. That's our driving force for our business. Integrity is, of course, very important. And then we have to have a purpose and a positive impact. As I said, if you say, I'm only doing business because I want to make money, to me, that's not going to be my answer. I want to do, to do the business because I want to make a positive difference in our community. And then I want to be proud of that, and I want my colleagues and families to be proud of that. That's the reason I do, I do that. Teamwork is very important because I'm here to you know, give you a talk, but I can only do this because my colleagues are working today you know, at the QED increment. They, they know what they have to do, and they, they are supporting the business. That's the reason I can do what I have to do, and what I want to do. So teamwork is very important, therefore, you have to eliminate negative attitude. And then simplicity. This is what I learned uh, in physics. When you do physics problem, do you understand why you have so many examples where everything is a sphere? You know, a, a ball is dropping. And then we try to describe the motion of that ball, for example. Why not a uh, display? It's because sphere is the simplest form. Whether I talk about a sphere or this, essentially, there will be no difference with respect to the motion of uh, these two objects. Of course, there will be some differences that people may want to talk about. So my physics education here has been doing great for me because I try to simplify everything, even in business. 
We have so many business uh, uh, situations and uh, uh, difficulties, but I try to analyze what's the core, what's the essential problem here, what do I have to pay attention to? I think it came from my physics uh, education, so that's great. Okay? And then another thing I say is that at QED, of course, uh, there are smart people, a lot of uh, smart people. But I emphasize the ability to finish, not with comma, but with period. Because to be able to finish is ability and capability, which I highly value. If you cannot finish, it's the same as you didn't do anything, in my opinion. So I say finish it with a period, not with a comma. That's very important in business. And then at the end of the day, we want to have a very optimistic, positive attitude because life is wonderful. We have great friends. Every day is beautiful. So we can do more. So that will be my message. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Do not want 
anybody to think of connecting or developing devices. So we are protected. And moreover, if we don't provide our device, other companies such as Toshiba, they can sell MRI scanners. MRI scanner is, you know, let's say from I mean the price starts like 1.5 million to, you know, it goes up to 11.7 million, uh, say 12 million, right? But our device could be 100,000 or quarter million, I mean, altogether. Without it, you cannot sell the scanner. In fact, there will be no image capability. So that's the reason that we depend upon each other. And then OEM and ourselves are trying to expand the business market worldwide so that we will be both good. I'll take the last question then. And I have to admit that uh, when I gave the introduction this morning, my brain wasn't working, and I said that you were the uh, first speaker since 1964 to have graduated from Monmouth College and given a high lecture. And in fact, that wasn't accurate. There are, were two speakers in that time that somehow I forgot about that attended Monmouth College, and one graduated from the college. One of them was John Corson, who attended here for only one year. He gave a great talk two years ago and talked about the importance of ethics in the banking business, and, and we were struck with the integrity and ethics that he distributed during a very difficult time in the financial markets. And then, and then the next speaker was Kevin Goodman, who is the CEO of Sonosite, which is a medical technology business uh, uh, using a different frequency uh, uh, radiation than yours, but, but a, a different, uh, oh, different frequency of wave than yours. But, but again, uh, work is very similar to yours. And so as I looked at your talk, it was in many ways very similar to, uh, to Dr. Goodwin's and very similar to uh, John Corson's. So what I wonder, I wonder what it is about a Monmouth experience that instills integrity and ethics of the highest character and causes people to be interested in working at the intersection of science and business. It's an excellent question. Actually, I was going to say that, um, you know, often Midwest is known for a, uh, a good ethics and, uh, you know, very heartfelt, um, accommodating, you know, attitudes and uh, atmosphere. But I truly believe that Mammoths offers a Mammoths party. And uh, as soon as I, you know, I landed at the airport um, at Morin, I started feeling it. <laughs> and uh, it's a great institution because it's a small community, but everybody is united, and everybody is trying to help each other. And then I think that goes for a long distance. I mean, you may not realize this today, but as you, you know, uh, go along your life, and then you become a professional at some point, you would uh, definitely find your experiences at, at Mammoth very rewarding and heartfelt. And uh, you just want to keep these good values, Mammoth's values. I think, uh, you know, I, I have been uh, very grateful to this institution. Thank you very much. Uh, of different places that you've spoken, but we, we want to give you one more trophy to set on your mantle. mantle. Uh, Susan, do you have a, uh, a momentum of this speech? <laughs> Again, thank you very much.